Hello and welcome to another episode of the Ancient Warfare Podcast. Um, with me today are Mark DeSantis, Michael Murray Dam, and I am Jasper Ortuis, and I'm the editor of Ancient Warfare Magazine. In the recording booth is sound engineer uh, <laughs> Angus Wallace. <laughs> Nice. And today we're going to be talking about the latest issue of the magazine, issue 16.4, which is all about the campaigns of Pharaoh Tutmosis III. Well, we already agreed that we were not able to date his reign very precisely, so we'll just keep it to 15th century BC. Um, that, that covers most offered uh period you don't want to get into the high and the low calendar no let, let's not that that's 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 a good way to get everybody to go cross-eyed very quickly and it is you know at least where i am it is after 11 p.m so uh, i'm already at the point of going cross-eyed anyway okay. uh, yeah going back far further than than we normally do in uh, in ancient warfare to uh, wh- what has been called the first recorded battle the yeah. first recorded battle at which point everybody goes, but the Sumerians, yes, plenty of battles, probably no idea about any detail whatsoever. And we are talking of Megiddo, correct? Yes. So I think the, I think the, the fascinating thing about the first recorded video uh, battle is the fact that <laughs> video that'd be it, nice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Video evidence from from well uh, from from the 15th century BC. Uh, but the it is because we do have multiple sources uh, for the battle, which is unusual. And normally we talk about the annals and the issue has a, a, a transcription of the annals translation by Breasted. But there are, I think, seven inscriptions and various points in the Egyptian empire, which record yeah, various royal stele where different, uh, different Moses details mm. represents himself, brags about or not what he did. So I think that's, that's what makes it, an, uh, an endlessly debatable what actually happened battle and the detail of the the, the war diary um, or the campaign diary that eventually ends up on the, is it the seventh pylon? I think I'm going to say seventh pylon. I think so, office. yeah. Yeah. Uh, that's, you know, in a way more detailed than we get for centuries afterwards um, in terms of, you know, the, the march, how many days march, the debate between the commanders. You're like, wow, this is heady detail d- delivered through a, a, you know, a, a propagandistic filter. Yes. But still. I'm glad you noted that. That's very important. Amazing. Detail. And yeah. But even, you know, even to the point that there's a disagreement and it's not, it's in a way, it's not like the Battle of Kadesh later with Ramesses II, where it's like, I knew all the time I was going to win. And you're like, it really doesn't look like you did. Um, and it looks like they fooled you, you know, with the the false deserters at the Battle of uh, Kadesh. But here it's like the army didn't want to, you know, follow my, my route of march. And I told them, do you trust me? We trust you. We'll go where you lead. And then, you know, it's, 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 it's so modern <laughs> and at the same time, very ancient. And and just like a modern action film has a giant plot hole, which is he emerges from this pass in where it's it's right to be defeated in detail, right? This this um, short span and somehow that doesn't happen, which is one of the big things that, uh, that dogs me about that battle. But I'm glad you brought up the propagandistic nature because it has this in common with a lot of our Persian sourcing. For the later wars, and then I, I go. We were discussing before we started recording Ashoka the Great, the the famous um, uh, late Marian king, who was sort of the the first real Buddhist imperial um, military um, dominator. And in all of these cases, what do we have? We have epigraphy from the voice of the conqueror, and that's your source, really. You know, basically, there's no competing source for it, um, and. What do you do with that, right? <laughs> How do you take that seriously? And I do think it's important as we start to talk about this and contextualize this, especially because Tutmosis' reputation is the Napoleon of Egypt. You know, it's huge. And there's undoubtedly some truth to that. But our the bedrock of our source on, on Tutmosis' genius is Tutmosis' staff. <laughs> and that's something that as historians, it's really important that we keep in mind. It goes, of course, for pretty much anything ancient. Well, well, let me let me defend my let me defend my beloved classical Greece in that, you know, when we're talking about the Peloponnesian War, you know, you have Thucydides, you have Xenophon, you have that. That's true. And at least Thucydides got kicked out. I mean, right. Right, right. You, you have competing sources. You know, it's one of the reasons why the Spartans are such fertile territory these days is because there's no 
Oh, let's not, let's not, not today. Let's not get distracted, no, no, not Mike. <laughs> I just see that they, there's no writing from them. Um, and and uh, so there, there, there are, my point is there are multiple sources to compare to each other. We really do not have that, even in New Kingdom Egypt. No, but for once we know, not for once, I mean, it's it's not unusual for ancient battles to have a name and then we go, it was fought mm, somewhere in this area, but we don't know exactly where. We know where it is. We have a date for it, just no year. I mean, yeah, it feels like we have lots of, uh, lots of indeed, lo- lots of precise detail, and yet there's lots of stuff. As you said, Mike, why why is the army not defeated? Possibly because the enemy army was divided, but there's apparently debate too about whether it was, you know, is the battle on the day they emerged from the pass, on the day after? Is there a break in between? Um, you know, all these sort of tantalizing details still missing. No, I think even as Professor Klein noted in his uh, Centerfold article, we don't even know which level of Tel Megiddo today relates to the battle. So it's like we know this this fortress exists on this hill, the only hill in the area, you know. So it's like that's your option. Uh, and so the the actual ar- uh, you know archaeological layer that corresponds to the battle, we're not sure on. Uh, and I think there's I think he was saying that it's kind of come to level nine uh, is the is the sort of consensus one, but there are other opposing views. So that is amazing that we have this very detailed information on the one hand, yes, biased, but on the other, there's like, but what about? So it's a very what aboutism kind of battle. <laughs> But it's it's you know it but it's it's special in so many ways because it's you know it comes almost it's it feels like it's not entirely true we have sources for earlier kings and their campaigns but it it just seems to be like an explosion suddenly out of you know thousand by then you know this is a thousand years after the pyramids boom we get all this information out of no and, and suddenly actually also Egypt coming on a on a on the martial stage out of nothing um you know having they've they have a, a you know by the end of the second millennium bc egypt is pretty stable they have some you know ambitions down south but the borders are established and they're not really threatened so there's a certain conservatism about egyptian military developments and that goes on for a while and then the hyksos come and just they sweep it away and then they have to fight their way back and in the intro through the introduction of of the the chariot um uh archery the various other introductions into the egyptian army they finally start to adopt things and then they exploit that uh, under Moses, and it just it just all seems to come together at this time which makes it probably one of those fascinating because you have the sources and all these things happen at once and let me um and let me draw again. I won't use the Spartans this time, but let me draw another ancient example, which actually lends credit to what you're describing. So th- there's that debatable. So so we we're almost like we're talking about a military revolution, right? Almost like the military revolution we talk about under Maurice of Orange and Adol- Gustavus Adolphus. And whenever you're talking about that, you run the risk of technological determinism and like you know making things too 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 clever by half, too simple. But I want to point something out, and that is, and this is an argument I've made many times, even on this show. In 390 BC, you have the Battle of the Alio with a Roman hoplite legion at the time, which hoplite phalanx is swept away by the Sinones. Is that right? And they sack Rome. And there's this historical trauma uh, that enters into the Roman military culture. And you can watch the Romans self consciously copy Celtic innovations in the edging of the scutum, in the Montefortino pattern helmet, in the, in the formation of the Gladius Hispaniensis from their contact with the Celtiberians. And what we get to is the Polybian Legion, which is so successful in a very quick period of time, almost the same way that the Meiji Imperial Japanese sort of um, very self-consciously adopt modern technology at the, at the end of the age of the samurai when Perry opens up Japan. Um, so people sort of say, well, this is too, too simple an explanation. And I'm like, yeah, it's too simple an explanation, but a, we see it again, even in the ancient world, granted, you know, almost a millennium later. And the Roman example is extremely clear cut. I will go toe to toe with anybody on that. A lot of evidence of that. Um, and then what do we see? We see the lighter post Hittite two wheeled chariot. We see the 
the wider intervals to allow for pivoting. We see the composite bow and we see the bronze Kopesh, right? This cleaver sword, which Grace looked, and I'll tell you, man, it wasn't there before and now it is. <laughs> so, and what's the one thing that happened is the Hicksa. So, so I really think there is some, not just evidence in the moment um, for the innovations of both the tactical and technological innovations, but there's evidence later throughout history of similar things occurring that we have proof for, which sort of retroactively backs this up. I don't know if that carries any water with you. I, I think the I think the fascinating thing also, though, with the Egyptian mindset, and when you look at the literature, the idea that you know the the borders of Egypt being established, and you look at their literature, the idea of dying outside of Egypt, the idea of journeying outside of Egypt is kind of oh, we don't want to do that this sort of take me back to my homeland kind of stuff. And so I think the fascinating thing about the defeat of the Hyksos and the ad adoption and adaption of their technology uh, into the Egyptian military mindset, if you like, also leads to a, 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 a an explosion of ambition under Tutmose the first and Tutmose the second. And, you know, it's sort of like, oh, we can conquer. Um, and so you suddenly get this, these, and, when you look at them, they're not incremental. They're not like when you look at the comparison with Rome. It's not like, yes, we'll conquer the cities next to us and then the next cities next to them and eventually get an Italian peninsula empire. It's this, you know, oh, we're, we're going to head for the Euphrates. <laughs> You're like, whoa, dude. Um, so there's, you know, the actual, the imperial, and I, I understand that there's large swathes of desert here that, you know, you have to march. But even that, you know, even that is amazing uh, that you would go, well, yes, we'll, we'll march to through the desert and we'll get to, uh, you know, what is the modern sort of uh, Syria-Palestine uh, kind of... I, I read a fascinating thing about Herodotus that um, he talks about it all... He talks about Palestine in, in book two, but it's the whole area is Palestine unless you're a Phoenician or an Arab. So everyone else, when he talks about Egyptian history and the conquest of, of uh, the Levant, everyone else is a Syrian Palestinian. If you if you if you basically say if you're not Phoenician and not Arabic, you're a Syrian Palestinian, and you're like, oh, okay. So he's in his own mind, he's correct, even though uh, you know in modern terms we would divide them into very small tribal uh, cultural, cultural cultural groups. Can I add on the one thing you said, Murray? So you're, you're talking, you mentioned this sudden and really impressive explosion of imperial expansion to the, to the Northeast and to the Levant. And right now, all we're doing is crediting military technology. I'll never forget when I was at the um, Archaeological Museum in Pilos researching the bronze lie, I found a, um, uh, a ceramic uh, a water bottle that was designed for women's pain, for um, women's um, like endometriosis. Um, and it was third century BC. And uh, it had been the only reason we had it, it was it was a grave good. And it was just the only one I've ever seen. And one of the things I was really struck by is we save the arms and armor, right? We throw out the other stuff. Um, and so how much of that kind of tech are we missing and not knowing about, right? Because people don't save it. You know, people save the, the arms and armor and the jewelry. So, you know, if we are uh, accepting that all of this military tech is coming from the Hyksos. What about logistical tech? Interesting that I was reading about this uh, and thinking about this explosion. From what I read, you know, it takes several reigns of Egyptian pharaohs to drive out the Hyksos. So you, you know, and that's in the 17th dynasty. So just at the end of the uh, intermediate period, which suggests that, you know, perhaps you get several pharaohs consecutively getting used to campaigning all the time, which they, you know, so, so that may be, you know, you get into this mindset of we're always at war and fighting back. And once you keep fighting back all the way north to get the Hyksos out, you might as well keep, you know, you can at least, you, you can imagine how you can get a sort of a dynamic going that it just keeps going by itself. And I was reading Spallinger and he says that it seems what they did is that they, the Navy, the Egyptian Navy was long more important because, you know, you have the Nile. So you, that control of the Nile is important by which way they probably, that was their logistical hub. You know, you get the, you get the, your food on the, on the ships and you transport it into various bases. And, it, you know, we can maybe talk about if we can figure out anything about how that went from Megiddo. 
So perhaps that technology was already there. They had that figured out how to campaign, march the army on the side. And these armies are not big. They cannot have been big. Well, 10,000, 10, 10, right? Um, you know. uh, Spounger says far fewer. Yeah. I think they're, talk, they're talking a thousand. I think he, he has a thousand chariots. And that no, matches. Is just, yeah. Is maybe, it a thousand, two thousand? It's not many. He, he, it's he, not many at all. Took Moses mm. 2,000, and they capture nearly a thousand. Um, 928. Chariots. Yeah. 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 yeah, 24 uh, yeah. chariots and, at um, Megiddo. But I think I think the thing is that some numbers are bigger and some numbers are smaller, and it's like, you know, later we have the same issue, um, except it goes into the hundreds of thousands, 900,000, 400,000. Um, but I think the interesting thing is also that habitual, because you'll get the idea that Tutmose the Third, having had this hiatus under Hatshepsut when she's co-regent, then relaunches the idea of his grandfather and his great grandfather. Uh, I'm sorry, his great grandfather. Uh, no, no, just grandfather Murray. Um, and the issue, the issue now, of course, is that people are going that that the under Hatshepsut there are military campaigns. The idea that she's, you know, the expedition to Punt. There's there's amazing um, reliefs of soldiers, so it's clearly not just an economic exercise, which is also paying into that logistics idea. These expeditions to gain resources and make allies, these are perfect part and parcel of campaigning further afield. So the idea that you know uh, Tutmoser emerges as a fully uh, accomplished soldier, he he must have learned somewhere in the first twenty two years of his reign. Oh, as co regent of uh you know and uh i'll say his name wrong jihuti uh clearly these generals who've served for long periods of time so there seems to be suggested all sorts of you know long military careers for commanders and experience and uh you know the the young commander the the, the henry five of his time just to make a shakespeare comparison um has been brought up in the army and then becomes the leader the army needs at the time the empire wants to expand. So there's, there's there's a combination of ambition, technology, and the right people in the right places. All all at the you know when when Hatshepsut dies, but then at the same time you've got this rebellion of three thousand three hundred three hundred cities. I think one of the other inscriptions mentions that number coming against Egypt. But within a within two months of Hatshepsut dying, he's off, and you're like, well, he hasn't organised this in two months. This is this has been brewing for some time, or even you know they knew Hatshepsut was sick or, or ailing, and therefore they they've formed this this alliance. So the rebellion was brewing for some time as well. Probably. Yes, exactly yeah. right, exactly right. So, uh, and I think it's one of the fascinating things to me of all ancient warfare is how much these barbarian tribes over the Rhine, over the Danube, anywhere else in the Roman empire or the Greek empire, they know exactly what's going on in at home, but we only have the sources of what's going on at home. And of course there's this unexpected barbarian invasion. What's happening. It's like, well, they knew exactly what was happening. They knew your King had just died. They knew you were having a succession crisis. They knew that now is the time to strike because you're weak. Uh, time at time and time and time again. But the only evidence we have of that is the, you know, the perfidious uh, people rebelled in the North. So I went and punished them. And that idea of going, well, why did they rebel? Why did they rebel now? Why did they invade then is always the, you know, the timing of those sorts of things is always at a time of internal crisis of some kind. So the idea that there's this widespread diplomatic network and trade network. I mean, trade networks are, are huge. Anyone who's dealt with a merchant, they talk. They they just blather. And if you ask the right questions, you'll learn exactly what's going on at home. And I think that kind of, I suppose calling it an intelligence network is not quite right, but it is very much a, a, a network of, of, of information. And you find these rebels for lack of a better term, they're patriots possibly from their own perspective, um, you know, the, reacting to this information. And that implies, which is another um, grey area, and I think Spallinger touches on it. If 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 he's the Napoleon of, of Egypt, what are they rebelling against? Uh, haven't they been part of the Egyptian empire already? 
if they're going to be rebelling? You know, are we actually dealing with an empire that was put in place by Tutmosis the first and second, and then held somehow under Hatshepsut? Yeah, but it's also you know the the, the structure, the nature of the empire is. Um, what is it, mostly based on tribute? I think uh, that's what I was going to say. Like, what? That's a good point. Like, is it is it is it a cultural rebellion about about the imposition of gods? Is it on a social matter? You know, look, we're in the you know we're it's the 15th century BC. There's not a lot to go on. You know, you have these tribute lists, and some of the names that appear on the tribute lists are like, hang on a minute, are we are we thinking that that empire? Is is a vassal state to Egypt? Surely, surely not. And you know that again, we only have the Egyptian perspective of like, oh, I'll I'll, I'll put the Mitanni on there. I'll I'll put Babylon on there. I'll put you know. You're like, wait, they're way bigger and more powerful than you. Well, it's it's you know it's possibly just emissaries from a king who bring some really nice gifts, and it's like they have given me no tribute, therefore they go on the list. I mean. Uh, yeah, and can they read? Can they read hieroglyphic? No, 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 not tribute. Uh, you know, uh, wait. Actually, oh, <laughs> yeah. this this um, it's a a book about a, um, a wine. The editor of Ancient History magazine, our sister magazine, did a, a review of that book um, fairly recently, and I listened to the audiobook version of it. And there, the, actually, she goes into that there were definitely professional translators at these various courts. It's actually it's a fascinating, just sort of more of a general overview of the ancient Near East. Amanda Podney, uh, Weavers, Scribes and Kings. There we go. Yeah. Uh, very, uh, I, the audiobook version was uh, uh, definitely recommended if you just want to get some overview and impressions of uh, what we've learned from various small archives there is there is a lot more information out there it's just you know uh speaking of as we discussed before we went on air uh speaking of languages you have to learn you know cuneiform <laughs> not perhaps the easiest one to get into but uh, i believe ai is helping there too right now i always i always think it's a miracle any history ever gets done at all with all every every historian if you're going to do it right you need to know seven languages it's impossible and the nuances well, those are Mitanni spelling mistakes in those Kinaiform tablets. Oh, okay. Nice. Uh, exactly. <laughs> um, we did have one question uh, from Abram, who, who I think uh, often submits questions for a podcast. And he wanted to know um, if we know anything about the maintenance required for chariot warfare uh, on long campaigns in this era. I, I, I was considering first, I, I, I don't know, but I'm just considering that you know, a, a chariot was mostly wood. Something had to have come loose at some point of time. So, if it, if it's going to be if it's going to be used, it requires maintenance, periodic maintenance. And uh, it, interestingly enough, you know, when researching uh, Megiddo, I believe it was suggested that the chariots were carried through this very narrow pass, and it, it got me to thinking that. Uh, in, not that chariots were carried as they were being taken out through from Egypt all the way up to Megiddo in terms of, uh, uh, you know, in terms of that that long journey. However, uh, in the Middle Ages, uh, knights would have a riding horse and they would try to spare their war horse as much as possible to avoid to keep it fresh. I wonder, would Egyptian charioteers somehow not stay inside the cab of their chariot to save the wear and tear of their own bodily weight as it uh, moved along? Would they have had some other, maybe not a riding horse, because uh, apparently they weren't riding many horses at that time. But do you think that there's something to that, that maybe they went in wagons or who knows? Go ahead. Pure speculation. There's some reliefs. There are some reliefs of the chariot bodies being carried on the shoulder. And actually, I think with the Tutankhamun tomb, they're really light. Like these are lightweight chariots. But A, that means they're fragile and will break. But B, they are transportable. Um, and I think there's been some stuff on, you know, that the, the the description, again, in the, in the, uh, the annals inscription is that horse must follow horse. Uh, and I know that from the the later campaigns in 1918, it's not that narrow. The the Aruna Pass, the Aruna Pass can fit uh, Lanchester armored cars up it. So it's not um, you know so 
narrow as as the, the the worried soldiers make out, which again can be played into by the whole propaganda. It's like you you say this pass is this dangerous place. I say it's not, uh, and I know what that they think. You know, it's what I, for me. Well, coming back to Mike's point, it, that whole always struck me as. But I know that they know that I know. And, uh, <laughs> you know, they're kind of like they think they think this is the dangerous path. So therefore, I'll take one of the other two, Tanak or, or uh, Jefty. But I know that they think that I know that. So I'm going to go up them. <laughs> like what? Murray, in your in your among your many identities, among your many identities, we now have to add ancient Egyptian king because clearly you. You've got- yeah, I, I, if I if I crimp the middle, I could be a Persian. But um, yes, uh, so yeah, that, it's always struck me as that that that's obviously his perspective, and um, the idea that he records that in that way, where the army doubts him, and he says, "I will lead you myself," and that's obviously the the moment we wanted to put on the cover is him leading the army, you know, and the army following him because he. You know, and the funny thing is, if you if you come at it from a leadership perspective, you know, the three kinds of leader, go there, go with me or, or follow me kind of leadership. In a way, the model that Tutmosa the third demonstrates in this narrative is that follow me leadership. You know, I will lead you. You you follow me. And if you and I think he even says, you know, follow me if you choose to. Uh, I'm going that way. And the army go, oh, of course, we'll follow you. Um, so, so, you know. so I will answer Abram's question because I know that Abram, like all of us nerds on this show, is a player of, of 4X games like Civilization. So, Abram, when you play games like Civilization, the technology tree is like wheel chariot. And if the technology tree was actual uh, or closer to what we know in the historical record, it would be all of these nuanced little uh, technological changes. It would be like... Wait, 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 wait. I played this... I played this game. It's wheel, chariot, road, railway, modern highway, and we can go all the way back to the ancient chariot. Right, right. And all of this is over the course of like five turns. So, um, but uh, it would be, it, but it, but it, it's, you know, like large chariot, slightly smaller chariot, smaller chariot, lighter chariot. And then one of the massive innovations um, that that came about, actually pretty close to Tutmos's uh, rain is metal cladding on the joints, um, on the axles, on the hubs of the wheels, um, which is something that shows up right around uh, when we believe his reign to be and these and this planning campaigns to be. Uh, and it's I mean, it may seem like a, a very simple thing that if you let wood rub against wood, you're going to have failure a lot faster than if you have metal cladding on it. But apparently this was a big technological innovation. And there was some evidence of the expense of, up to, of maintaining the chariot um, and specifically of, of having to replace that metal because look, in the 15th century BC, metal ain't cheap. Um, and uh, and that how that was used as evidence for the social position of the charioteer, um, showing that like the later horsemen. Um, so it, that what's interesting there, Abram, is that it ties it directly to the upkeep of the chariot specifically, not just the maintenance of the fodder of the horses, but replacing the silly little two and three inch metal cladding that you have on your axles and your hubs because they're going to wear out, you know, after one or two battles. Am I correct in remembering that there was a specific palace official in Mycenae whose job was to look after the chariots? Is is that? So, yeah, I, I think we did something on this in the, we had a chariot issue. issue. Yeah. We did, we did. 12, yep. 4? You know, you know, you have a successful magazine, Jasper, when you, when you can't remember your, <laughs> you've had so much, <laughs> so much content, you can't remember your issues. I have no evidence for this, but I do have evidence from later periods of animal fat being used to lubricate um, wheeled vehicles. And I, I'm trying to think of my earliest example. I actually probably talked to you, Murray, uh, on what the earliest example, obviously the famous medieval examples of using it for siege towers. And I think, if am I crazy that um, Heliopolis, uh, Demetrius, the uh, Poliochetes, is, didn't, isn't there some described description of animal fat on the wheels to move that thing? Or am I there crazy? could be. There could be. I'm thinking there might be something in Aeneas Tacticus. I'm not sure. It's really um, late, though. It's still really late. But I, look, I, I have no evidence for this. But there are later examples of it. And, and when you're, when you're, when you're scrambling for sources for a period without any. Yeah, yeah. I, I love. I, I was reading recently. Um, 
someone was asking on on Facebook about uh, evidence for forest fires in the ancient world, and there's some in the Iliad. There's also some in uh, Thucydides, where he talks about forest fires being caused by the branches of trees rubbing against one another. You know, lightning strikes didn't come into the consideration. Uh, you're like, I'm not sure that branches rubbing against one another is going to force, you know, uh, fire, you know, chariots bursting into uh, spontaneous combustion. You're like, whoa, that's because you need you need some kind of lubricant on your axle. Um, but I was I was I was doing some, uh, you know, there was some stuff done recently that you couldn't really carry more than three days food or water for yourself Uh uh, on March in ancient warfare. Um, you know, obviously, you've got wagons and you've got logistics. And with the Egyptians, certainly within Egypt, you've got the Nile. But again, the idea of a of a accompanying fleet, perhaps, um, we're not sure. But what, what oh, the, goes the crazy fast. Dr. Google, what Dr. Google tells me is that you need around two kilograms of feed per hundred kilograms of horse body weight. And your average horse is between 700 and 1,000 kilos. So, you know, you're looking at uh, essentially 70 kilos or, you know, 35 to 70 kilos of Mark, food. do you, you want to have a pounds per bellion since we're American Oh, here? Are we going to take Time 2.2. Multiply by 2.2 per day per horse. So you are dealing with Smaller tons. horses at a time. You're still dealing with tons of fodder, tons I assume that a new kingdom Egyptian army is going to function like every other ancient army. It's going to strip the land clean, right? It's going to. But this is this is this is you know, this is the the Sinai. Uh, I don't know, you know, how wide how wide do you have to to strip to get what you need? And we know these day, you know, the 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 lengths of marches that we're given in these fourteen yeah, days. There's march, not much time. Eleven to do that. days march. No, for the distance because it's about twenty kilometers a day. So. The, the three-day uh, figure for how much uh, food and water a, an army could take with it, I think that comes from Donald Engel's The Logistics of the Macedonian Army. And I, I also believe that probably the Egyptians under Tutmosis would have had to rely on uh, waterborne resupply because I believe that Alexander the Great's a concept for when he was marching westward through the Makran Desert in the province of Gedrosia was that he was going to have the fleet shadow him and resupply his army, which it failed to do. And that's one of the reasons why the Macedonian army suffered so tremendously uh, in, in that regard. That seems to you know, reinforce the idea that Moses was getting a very substantial portion of his supplies, not from the land he was passing through, though there must have been some of it, but probably from the uh, Egyptian Navy or and associated via, uh, vessels. And combining uh, seven pillars of wisdom with the Old Testament as my evidence for this, um, also, of course, the, the knowledge of and uh, importance of wells that you know if there are springs and wells that you know of at certain distances between x y and z in that area that's where you head to you know and we know from we know from the old testament we know from seven pillars of wisdom how important those water sources are just for american american listeners when murray says z he means z uh last letter of the of the uh, american alphabet i'm sorry we still call it the, the american alphabet. alphabet the american alphabet oh, nice. that's right uh, uh but uh i'm letting my imperialism show uh so, but the other and the other obvious example is the the persian campaigns which always had a fleet uh shadowing the, the land so there's i mean look again i always feel uncomfortable extrapolating this stuff backwards by and let's be clear like it's at least 500 years when you're trying to get back to or, you know, sometimes a thousand years when you're trying to get back to even New Kingdom Egypt, it's really easy to sort of think of, well, it's all ancient. You know, no, this is really ancient. Um, but yeah, we have a lot of example of of um, waterborne logistics being the solution there. But it, but it says in the campaign, I think, that they stop at Giza, right? Or Gaza, which is, <laughs> yeah, sorry, yeah. Uh, uh, both. <laughs> they stop on at Gaza. So that's, you know, that's on the coast. So presumably, again, coming back to what you said, Murray, about preparation, that is presumably a logistics hub where stuff has been prepared for the army so that it, from there it can go on. And there may have been other allied cities um, on the route. One of the other inscriptions names another place, which we think is a, another port further north from Gaza as well. But it's not it's not in the it's not in the, the annals inscription. It's in a later one. Is that, that's I mean, that's what we said. Indeed, in all other ancient campaigns where we know how it works, it's either by sea 
or combination or sea or river. So waterborne transport. And there's and there's magazines that have been set up for armies to Well, there's later there's later campaigns where he seems to sail straight to Byblos and and Sidon. So, you know, he bypasses the march. So clearly there are allied cities. And one of the things, of course, about the uh the march in Gaza is this is clearly a city that has not rebelled. You know, there's no question of conquest. Um uh, Biblical scholars obviously get uh, tied up in knots about the fact that Jerusalem isn't mentioned, but then this is a coastal march, uh, and you know the march up the coast to Gaza and then to Megiddo is obviously not going to go as far inland. But uh, the the idea of uh, having cities who've remained loyal, I mean, even the even the location of oh, I forgot the name now where they march from to the Aruna Pass, which uh, El Ansur I think is the modern name for it, um, where they meet and then march on. That's also probably a, uh, a a community which has remained loyal and hasn't joined the rebels. So the suggestion we get out of these locations he marches to and doesn't need to fight when he gets there are that these are bastions of loyalty, possibly with garrisons. Um, within that whole kind of community. Yeah, and I, I just wanted to add, um, as I've spent a lot of time in the, well, not a lot of time, but more time than I would that I would have liked to in the Euphrates Tigris River Valley. And I, I want to remind listeners, there's a real temptation to think of North Africa as a desert. And the Euphrates Tigris River Valley, it looks like Montana. It's like really fertile, tall grasses, like plenty to eat. Um, it's not uh, a harsh desert. Now, I know you're talking about the Sinai, uh, Murray, but the Sinai is pretty big, you know, and there are parts of it. Um, so I, I do think that um, even for a, a large-ish army, um, it, uh, although I don't, you know, I'm, 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 I'm nervous at my last face plant uh, getting involved in figures here, but it, it is, I do think it's possible with meat on the hoof and, and forage um, to have done better than, than we're maybe crediting it for. I think I mean it was, I remember teaching at uni back in the nineties and people going fertile crescent, it's a desert. You're like no no no, it's it's called the fertile crescent for a reason. The name isn't wrong. You know your 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 thinking of why is it called the fertile crescent is the the mistake here, not the fact it's called the fertile crescent. Yeah, like yeah. around like this is why you know it's it's funny people always talk about it. Iraq, they're like, oh, you know, you were in a desert. No, Al Anbar, which is two thirds of the country, the modern country, is a desert. Yes, but that's not where anybody lives, except for Bedouins. You know, right? Most people live in the in the northeastern one third of the country, which I'm not exaggerating. It looks like Montana. It's it's that those two rivers really provide a lot of water, and um, it's just grass up to your neck. It's beautiful. It's like rolling rolling grasslands. It's beautiful. On that note, <laughs> Tutmosa being a bit like uh, Russell Crowe in Gladiator, running his hands along, you know, uh, high grasses as he marches towards. Don't forget Megiddo. that picture, maybe. Uh, look no, in the magazine no, no. for other reconstructions. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Mark, Mike, and Murray. And I'll see you again soon. Bye bye. My pleasure. Thank you. Bye. Bye.